Well, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. I really appreciate, appreciate this opportunity to present uh, our honing capabilities at Sun and Products. Uh, this morning our, our discussion is going to be, as you very well know, engine part honing. Uh, what's next after cil the cylinders are honed? A couple things that I want to keep want you to keep in mind during this presentation is this. First off, an internal combustion engine, as we all know, is nothing more than a pump. And the better that we can seal that pump, the better it's going to work. So therefore, geometry, surface finish, things of that nature play a very key role in that operation. The second thing that I want you to keep in mind as we go through this presentation is that one of the things that an internal combustion uh, relies on is to have at the least amount of friction as possible. And this particular presentation is going to cover some of those issues with honing some parts that maybe some of you have never experienced honing before. So with that, let's start with something very simple, and that is, uh, what is honing? Okay. Uh, the reason that uh, I want to discuss this so you get a little bit better understanding on what happens when you actually hone. Okay, the bore finish process. There are uh, five things in this process that we we have to address before we actually start to hone. And that is, first off, we have to choose the proper stone. We have to have the proper tool or the mandrel. We have to have the proper oil or coolant and we have to have the proper pressure and we have to have the proper speeds. Uh, we at Sun and gave this a name, we call it SMOPS. I know that sounds like a little silly name, but basically that incorporates everything that has to happen uh, during the time period that we are, uh, we are actually honing. Okay, let's, let's walk through this uh, for just a minute and let's talk about the first off, the stone. The stone, first off, <clears throat> the, uh, the grit is going to be con uh, consist of either silicon carbide, aluminum oxide, and sometimes it's diamond, which is mined diamond, and other times it may be CBN or referred to as horizon, which is man-made diamond. The grid also contains a, a size. Uh, we can do at Sun and Chronics anywhere from a, a grid size of around 36 all the way up to 1600 grid size. Now what holds that grid together is the bond. That bond is very important as well because it can be made of either metal, uh, fatrified, uh, and, and with that we can we can also with that bond we can make that bond work differently on different applications. Meaning that it could be a softer bond for harder parts, or it could be a harder bar bond for for uh, softer parts. The choice really depends on the material that we're honing whether it be cast iron, steel, ceramic, there's several different things that, that, that come into play when it comes to the bond. Okay, the next is of course the tool. And we need to make, make a proper choice on the tool. Our tools obviously are in our catalog. We have two catalogs that are available to all of our customers. We have a honing engine catalog and we also have a catalog that is for our industrial customers. Now for those of you that do not have that industrial catalog, with some of the different bimetals that are now out there, remember, you know, back in the day, back in the 60s, we basically we honed more cast iron than anything else. Well, in today's world, we have many more different types of, of bimetal products that are on that internal combustion engine, as well as the fact that we can, in fact, hone a lot of different parts on that engine. So with that being said, the industrial catalog would come into play and it wouldn't be a bad idea to have one. Uh, one of the things that's very important during the time period that we're looking at choosing the proper tool is that mandrel is we always want to look at the length of the part obviously in the bore diameter. That length of the part needs to, that mandrel needs to be at least two thirds of the length of the part to one and a half inches. So we need to keep that in mind as well. We don't want the mandrel to be too long or we don't want the mandrel to be too short because this can cause a lot of geometry problems as well as bell mouthing, barreling, things of those natures. Okay. We also make a standard and portable tools. We're going to cover that in this presentation. The next, of course, is the oil. Uh, the coolant which the lubricants remove from the bore. Okay. 
oil-based, we're going to be talking a lot of the, about the oil-based. Uh, those of you that are familiar with part numbers, our MAN 845, as well as our MB30, which is oil-based coolants. Uh, also, there's water-based. Water-based is mainly used on diamonds. Now, one of the things that I wanted to do just uh, to talk about here for just a minute is that in a lot of cases, people have put out this myth that you cannot use diamonds and oil together. Uh, that, in fact, is a myth. You can, in fact, use both together. Water base, on the other hand, cannot be used with a standard conventional abrasive. So if, for example, you have a honing machine that you're running a coolant in, and you decide that now I'm going to hone something with a vetrified stone, that does not work very well because it's not compatible. Again, the choice is going to depend on the material. Next, of course, is pressure. Pressure is very important, and a lot of folks out there, uh, I've been into many, many shops over the years to sun and products, they don't totally understand what pressure really is. And the pressure is what's applied to the stone. Think of pressure as a spring. Now this spring, we can lighten that spring, or we can raise the tightness of that spring. And that's going to determine on how much pressure is behind that stone to make it cut consistently during the process. A lot of people think that all i got to do is just crank up what we call the, the, uh, the, the feed, or not the feed, but the, uh, where we want to raise the wedge into the, into the tool. And if you crank that up really, really tight, you've eliminated feed pressure. And all you're going to do at that point now is crush the stone. You're going to cause a lot of geometry problems and things that you really don't want to happen during the honing process. And of course, the last thing is speed. That's the rotation and the stroke speed which determines the crosshatch angle. Now, we know the crosshatch angle certainly is very important when it comes to cylinders uh, where a piston and ring is going to seal against. Crosshatch angle doesn't quite play quite as big a role on what we're going to be talking about today. But that being said, one of the things that we've learned with our more industrialized machines is that stroke speed, when you can increase it, automatically very fast. We can remove material quicker. We can create better geometry. So again, on those type of machines where you have the capability not only to automatically stroke, but obviously the rotation can be varied. In those cases, we can create better geometry and we can create a, a process that would allow material to be removed at a much faster rate than done by hand. Okay, uh, some of the honing applications that we're going to be talking about today, uh, we can look across these pictures. Some of them are pretty old pictures, but I think everybody that's had anything to do with an internal combustion engine over the years recognizes some of these applications. And then you'll see some, some here on this next page that uh, maybe you weren't, didn't, weren't really familiar with the fact that, hey, we can in fact hone these parts. Now let's just, uh, let's talk briefly here about uh, I'm going to list for you the different parts that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, these parts are applications that we'll uh, discuss. We'll cover some of the do's and don'ts about honing these parts. Okay, let's look at the first one, cam tunnel in the block, crank tunnel in the block, obviously, balance shaft tunnels, as well as not only balance shaft tunnels, but some idler tongue in the block can also be honed. Harmonic balancers, are, and cam tunnels of course in the cylinder head. Harmonic balancers, this is, uh, this is one that I think everybody that's ever put a big block Chevrolet together and tried to drive the balancer on and a new balancer on has had trouble once, once in a blue moon of getting it on there. Well we can internally hone that and we can also externally hone it and we're going to be talking about that. Uh, valve stems externally piston pins internally and externally. And boy, that's a big question mark. Let's, we'll, we'll get to that later on in the presentation. Uh, connecting rods, large end as well as a small end. Valve guides, obviously internally. Crankshaft nose, the harmonic balancer end. The piston pin bores, the lifter bores, and then rocker arms and rocker arm shaft, both internally and externally. Now, during uh, this presentation, of course, too, I want to mention right where we're at this part right now, 
where you, you look at some of these applications and you say, why in the world would I ever want to, for example, uh, hone a, uh, a, a, a valve externally? Well, that has to do with guys that maybe are working on uh, uh, a race car engine and they're trying to get the maximum, the least amount of friction as possible. You know, and again, that's sign of a, a specialized application. It's not something that you're going to do every day in the rebuilt world. But one thing that you will be faced with in the real rebuilt world now and then is somebody that brings you a 1947 Willys and I can't buy any parts for it and there's just a little bit of wear on certain parts. Well, in a lot of cases, those parts can be repaired by owning them as opposed to just throwing them away and trying to re-engineer the wheel. So, Again, that's why we want to show you these different applications today and talk a little bit about them. Everybody uh, that's uh, ever been around an automotive machine shop um, certainly recognizes this honing machine. Uh, it's been around since the uh, 70s, and uh, we have uh, uh, we've built many, many thousands of them around there. Okay. The applications on this machine, there's actually four of them that I'm going to be talking about today. Those four applications are going to be line honing the, the crank tunnel, line honing the cam tunnel, uh, line honing the uh, balance shaft tunnel, and line honing cylinder hones. Okay, let's begin with the steps needed to line hone the, uh, 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 the cam or crank tunnel. Okay, we've all seen this. We need to cut the caps first. Not always necessarily 100% true about that because in some cases, if, the, if in fact the, uh, the caps or the bore diameters on the low side, we can just go in there and uh, I call just tickle that, uh, that uh, bore with a, uh, with a mandrel and really make it nice and straight and it works so much better. Okay, but cutting the caps is an important part of, of this operation. We want to take the least amount that we possibly can get away with. Because remember, we're only going to cut the cap. We're going to make it out a round hole. Okay. Choosing the proper tooling. Again, thinking about, number one, how long is that part? We don't want to, for example, if we look down the list there, use a 15 stone mandrel on a part that's only 23 inches long. That would be silly, and it would cause the ends of the caps to be, uh, the end caps to be very, very big. So we want to choose the correct mandrel for doing the application. Stones, again, well, I'm using the SMOPS theory here. All right, stones are also, uh, we recommend, and we always put in our mandrels, 150 grit stone, and it's a real hard bond because of the fact that we're going through interrupted pores at this point, and we don't want that stone to break down, and we don't want it to constantly be sharpening itself, which would bell mouth the caps not only on the outside, but on the inside as well. Setting up the mandrel. Let's talk briefly about setting the mandrel up. When you put the mandrel in the, uh, uh, in the bore, uh, we have got two pins in the center of that mandrel, which you can remove the cap. Put those pins in. Lay the mandrel so the mandrel is laying in the block with the guide shoes down. And on the far end of the mandrel, there's a crank. And we crank that up until we take all the rock out of that mandrel. Now that's the most common way that we know that we can set up that mandrel. So we've got basically a zero, zero if we were to run that mandrel with the dial indicator from top to bottom. And then at the next point that we're going to think, do is we're going to install the CH7500 coupler. Now one of the th things that I want to point out to you here, and I'm going to use my little mouse here to show you, okay, is this part right here that I'm pointing to. That part sets the beat control. So many people don't know what that's, that's for. And what you do is you crank that all the way down. It's got numbers on it from, from 0 to 9. If you crank it all the way down to 0, that's 10. That means that that spring is all the way collapsed, and it's going to crush that stone really, really hard. And if, the, if that's set right, uh, it's going to take a very strong person to be able to pull that mandrel back and forth. Okay, normally, where I'd like to see that set at is five and a half. Uh, that's the best spot to set it at. And then at that point, after we've set that, we want to take this right here and we want to crank up this end, which is, again, we're cranking the wedge into it. 
and this needs to basically come straight up and down so we've got a lot of free play to that point and then when we pull back on it at that point now we know we we've got pressure against it and that's how we remove it from the from the uh, from the part that's the best way to set this particular coupler up uh, and that has everything that we need as far as feed pressure is concerned again feed pressure is an important part of this okay and then at that point we set up how much we're going to stroke the machine and with overstroke which is very important and we set that off the machine itself and at that point now we now we can begin to remove material our mandrels are designed in such a manner that the mandrel itself has got what we call a seven degree negative offset to it what that means is this is the stones leave it in seven degrees negative so if they're going into the part what is happening is it's removing the high spots first. This is why we cut the caps and we're not taking much material out of the bottom. Okay. Uh, true, let's talk briefly before we go on to uh, doing an aluminum block, what it takes to... This is extremely important, especially not only on crank tunnels, but cam tunnels as well, because cam tunnels, we don't have this ability. Okay. With crank tunnels, what we do is we check, we hone, and we see which cap is getting bigger. Now, I know that there's some myths out there, what well, the cap's getting bigger, then all we do is release the cap, and then we continue to hone and until it's the rest of the size and then tighten it back down. What you just did was you created a more uh, untrue situation with that tool. That is not the correct way to do it. The correct way is to remove the cap take some more material off and get rid of that high spot in the tool. That's very important in, in honing. It's very important in truing any type of mandrel out there. Now let's talk briefly about aluminum blocks. Aluminum blocks, of course, you've got a biometal product, you've got hard caps, and aluminum is soft. So in that case, what we suggest is to set the mandrel up, starting off the way we talked about. Uh, setting it up with the pins, put the cap back on. Now what you want to do is you want to take a dial indicator with a magnetic base back by the coupler, and you want to put it on the mandrel. Set the mandrel up like it's ready to hone. What you, I want you to do is check where the stones are, release the mandrel, roll it over, and check again exactly where the guide shoes are, dead in the center. And what we're going to do at this point is we're going to offset that mandrel. We're going to start off at 10 thousandths. We want 10 thousandths more stone moving into that cap so it removes that material. And if that starts to make the hole rounder, and again, remember, you're not just going to check straight up and down. You're always going to check these pores at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. Okay, we want to check that, make sure that it's making the correction. If it's gaining on it, and we're, but it's not quite there yet, we can go all the way up to 30 thousandths on that. Okay, so that again is important. And it's important from this standpoint, which is under our next slide, which is talking about cam tunnel honing and balance shaft honing. We have no way to true that mandrel other than to find a block that's got the caps uh, or the, the pore size, approximately what that cam tunnel is, so we can true that mandrel incorrectly. And again, when we set this mandrel, we got no way to put pins in this mandrel. So therefore, we have to, again, set our position with a dial indicator. You want to set it off of the, uh, the stones, check it there, roll it 180 degrees, and check it on the bottom side of that mandrel to make sure that we're zero, zero on both ends. Cylinder head and cam tunnel honing. Uh, now, in this case, we make a, a, a driver that's called a GNN 150. And that's a portable driver unit. You'll notice that there's not as many U-joints as what's in our CH-75. The reason for that is on when we're doing a cam tunnel, we want that to be a little more rigid, so we only have one U-joint in there that allows the thing to float. Uh, just a side note, whenever we're honing something, something has to float. That's very, very important. 
something has to float, so it's either a U-joint in the tool itself or the part itself has to float. So what we've done is we've gained more rigidity here by using this type of a driver. It sets up the exact same way as a CH-75 does. And what we're going to do is, uh, again, we're going to set it with a dial indicator and try to get it as close as we possibly can to zero. Uh, now, it's not always possible with this because the guide shoes themselves normally are fixed. But in some cases, we can take and we can put a little shim under the guide shoes to raise them up to give it better center. OK, we're going to move on to our next discussion, which our next discussion, and we're all familiar at least with the, with the machine on the right there. That's our LBB1660 machine, which is a modern machine today. OK, that's a hand-operated machine, uh, of course, one of the nice things on it, I mean, it's got two feet controls, one here, one here. This right here, of course, that increases our, our uh, uh, the, uh, uh, oops, sorry about that. My fingers got in the wrong place here, guys. Uh, that increases the wedge. The other nice thing about both of these machines is you see there's a dial indicator there. That's an in-process dial indicator. Now, uh, I've seen so many times when people use this machine is they take their hands off the part that they're honing, and then they reach up and they increase the feed so it goes past zero. That is wrong. Don't do that. First off, you're now influencing the part by just grabbing the part with one hand, and that causes the part geometry to go a little bit wacky. So you always want to keep both hands on the part when you're stroking it. And when you reach zero, you take your foot off the pedal and you advance then how much more material you're going to take out. It's pretty reliable once you start to use this type of machine and know how much material is coming off of the part. And you can figure that into stone breakdown and how much material. And then that, that you can now put into the dowel indicator that shows the in process and it will allow you to hone to size. The machine over here on the left is more of a production style machine. It automatically strokes. It has feed control on it as well, but it, the stroking mechanism is controlled by a motor as opposed to a human being. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about connecting rod honing. Uh, Obviously, in the old days, we honed a lot more connecting rods than what we honed today. Uh, we, cut the, we cut the caps, we make the hull smaller, and then we choose the proper tool, and we, uh, uh, we hone it out to size. Obviously, today, we have a lot of what we call cracked caps out there. You cannot cut them. The only thing you can do to them is to make them a little bit oversized. There is an oversized OD bearing that is available to do that. Uh, I always suggest to folks to that at any point in time, if you have a rod that is spun, don't try to recondition it because it's turned blue or it's discolored. That means that the sense of strength is out of that connecting rod and you're asking for trouble. In today's world, if you're reconditioning connecting rods, it's always a great idea to put new bolts in. You just think, you know, most of the motors today out there run over 100,000 miles. Those bolts have been stretched and restretched a million times. So it's always a good idea to put new rod bolts in, new caps on, or new rod bolts and new nuts in when you recondition your connecting rod. Uh, just one word about this particular uh, tool right here. At the back part of this tool, it's got a mechanism that you can take and flip 180 degrees, and it has sizes on it. I tell customers, don't pay attention to those sizes, because normally that doesn't mean a whole lot. The purpose of that is to rotate it, it's, it's elongated, to try to make that tool run as straight on your machine as possible. Okay. Now remember earlier I had mentioned the fact that the, the tool has to have be anywhere from two-thirds to one and a half times the part. So many times on a manual machine I see customers going and taking one connecting rod and trying to hone it. You're creating bell mouthing on the end of it. You cannot stroke that part fast enough by hand not to do that. That's the reason why we put two connecting rods on this tool, because the tool is too long for the part. Now, it's different if we're talking about a production machine. A production machine can stroke it 
much, much faster than what a human being can. So therefore, you can use a single you use a single rod on a power stroke type machine. Okay, connecting rod honing. Again, let's talk about the small end now. And the small end, uh, two things. First off, a lot of rods today are free floating on that end. They've got a bushing in them. If you're going to replace that bushing, I highly recommend that you would always go in and do uh, 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 use some type of swedging tool to swedge that bushing in place. Because if you try to put a bushing in a connecting rod that's, that, that had a bushing in it, it is bushed that, that it is made to be swedged into the end of that rod. If you don't do that, you run the risk of taking out a lot of material, destroying geometry, causing bend, and a lot of other things. Okay, that uh, that uh, you could get into the back and beyond the back of the bushing itself, and and again cause problems there. Uh, you're going to use some low feed pressure when you go in and you actually hone that in. Okay, so you want to make it nice and straight. Okay, now here's one other little tip uh, that uh, that I learned early on in my career, and that is any brand spanking new pistons that are pressed on connecting. If you take the pins out of a new box of pistons and you measure those pins, you will find very quickly that those pins are three tenths of a thousandth larger than the standard pin. So if you do not hone that end of the connecting rod and create, you know, uh, go in there and make sure that the geometry is correct and the pin end is a little bit bigger to accept that, then you have to do one. You're going to do one of two things. You're going to overheat that rod when you put it together to get the pin in, which could cause a lot of different things. The pin could possibly bend a little bit, could cause it to destroy the, uh, the, uh, the pin end of the piston. Uh, it could not clamp down correctly because you expanded it so much. And in a lot, some cases, I've walked into shops where guys actually turn these connecting rods blue. That's not a good thing to do. Okay, so it's always a good idea if you're pressing pistons to make sure that they are correct size before you put them together. Okay, piston honing. Okay, tooling for honing and high performance slotted pistons. Uh, we make a mandrel that has got a keyway stone. When I say keyway stone, it means this. It means that there's two stones on that mandrel and there's two, two guide shoes on the end. And basically, if there's a slot in that piston, you need a way to bridge the gap over that slot. And that's the purpose of having the, the, the T-slotted or the uh, keyway style mandrel to be used on a piston like that. Now, I know that there's not a whole lot of, of uh, slotted pistons out there anymore. And in the high performance world, of course, they're a lot shorter. Again, you want to make sure that you buy the correct tool to do the piston. Length and bore size is very important. Remember those items. Okay. As long as I'm on this part where we're at the piston, let's talk about piston pins for a minute. Piston pins can actually be put into a chalk and they can be externally honed. Again, the purpose of this is going to be more so in the creation of somebody that is doing a high dollar racing engine. He's trying to get as much friction out of that as possible. You're not going to re you're not going to remove a lot of material. All you're going to do is polish that pin up. I've even been in high performance, high level uh, 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 NASCAR shops where guys go in and they actually hone the inside of the pin. They say that this relieves some of the stress and they're doing everything they can to make that motor run just as fault free as possible. So uh, again, that's something that you wouldn't do to an everyday rebuild, but in a real tricked out high performance engine, you're trying to eliminate any possibilities of any type of uh, I don't want to say failures, but making the motor run at its peak performance. Crankshaft balancers, ID honing. Crankshaft balancers, we all know that, that uh, you know they're basically a lot of them are made of steel. Some of them are some real hard steel, and they make the the. Uh, sometimes you get them, and they're very difficult to get on the end of the crankshaft nose. So again, this is a key weight part. So we would have to use a stone that is keyway to bridge the gap. 
Now you're not going to, again, remove a lot of material here. It's just a matter of just kind of going in there again and tickling it a little bit to make it a little bit larger and allow you to, uh, uh, to get that harmonic balancer on there better. Uh, you know, in a lot of cases, guys go in there and they don't do any measuring. I highly recommend that you measure the end of the crank, you measure the inside diameter before you go in there with the hone and try to remove material. You don't want to, you can always make it bigger, but you can't make it smaller. In some cases, again, we run into situations where, you know, the balancer really isn't bad, but it's got a few little nicks or whatever on the outside diameter of where it's going to run up against the seal. Again, Sun and Products makes what we call a external hone. This external hone also incorporates over here on this side, that's the feed mechanism on an external hone. So again, all the rules come into, into play here again. The stone, the tool, the feed, the speed, as well as the oil that you're going to use. Rock arm honing. Rock arm honing is, uh, is something that we don't do a lot of, obviously, but again, if we have an engine, for example, that has, uh, uh, we can't get parts for anymore, but we can maybe get a bushing or something to slide in there and rehone that, that would be great. Let's say we've got a rock arm shaft as an example that has got a little, little bit of burrs on it. Well, external hone. We can go in there and dust it up and polish it up and make it work. Okay, now we're going to move on to valve guide honing. And one thing in valve guide honing, we're, we're dealing with portable tools. And you look at the very first tool that I've got laid out here, and that tool is what we call a single pass tool. For those of you out there that, uh, uh, that have them. Uh, a lot of guys use what we call a live pilot system today for, uh, for cutting in seats. That means that that valve guide's got to be as straight as possible. Well, we used to make a machine called an HS60 that we could run this tool off of, which was nothing more than a big, than a drill uh, sitting on a spring. We couple this tool in there and we single pass that through the valve guide to straighten it out to take any dog leg out of that valve guide. That this tool, there's a misconception sometimes of how much material it can really take out. For a guy running bronze guides, five tenths. That's it, guys. And if you need to take more material out than that, then I would highly recommend you buy more tools or that maybe you go through a reaming process before you actually go through a honing process using this tool. These tools, there's a sleeve on this tool that is moved up and down. It's on a tapered uh, uh, mandrel. And once they're set, they're not designed to keep moving back and forth. If you keep moving them back and forth, think of it as a paper clip. All you're going to do is keep bending it, bending it until it breaks. So once it's set, you leave it set. And that tool will do many, many valve guides out there. But you don't, again, you don't want to move it back and forth. The next tool that we see down here, very common in valve guide honing. And one of the things that I want to show you that a lot of people don't understand is that right there. Uh, that particular part right there, that is your uh, speed pressure. And you don't want to crank that all the way down. You don't want to crank it all the way out. Again, you want to kind of look and see how much material are we taking out. Do we need to back it off if we're taking too much material, too much fast, too fast, and whether or not we're crushing that stone. So that is very, very important. You do not want to take and crank this part down all the way because you now have bypassed the feed pressure. And again, all you're going to do is crush the stone. In many cases, uh, again, these both of these tools are used in oil. They're vetrified. We're not going to use any coolant on it. Uh, the, uh, the, the single pass tool, we highly recommend the most lubricity as possible. So the MB30 would be, in a, would be a good oil to use when using that single External valve stem uh, honing. Uh, again, this is just a chart. This chart basically tells you sizes, what you need to, how much you want to remove. It gives you some different uh, uh, selections. Since this is in the catalog, it's easy to order what you need. Uh, we offer uh, uh, two different stones for this. One is for fast removal. That's a 300 
20 grit stone and the one for just doing some polishing that's a 500 grit stone there. And one of the uh, last things we're going to talk about as far as applications go is our lifter bore honing. Lifter bore honing again is a very popular item that we that is done out there and what I've done is I've added something here that's not in the catalog and that's right here down here at the bottom. Okay, a lot of guys out there use uh, machines that are coolant for honing, and they would like to use, uh, go ahead and use their, their lifter hone in that machine as opposed to taking the block out and setting up some other machine to be able to hone. So in that case, what we offer to you gentlemen is a diamond that can be used in a SV10 or any other hone out there that is coolant driven and you can in fact hone in that tub as opposed to removing the block and putting it under oil. Okay, Sun and Products prides itself in making a uh, gauge to, to basically to be able to measure anything that we hone. The nice thing about Sun's gauging systems is the fact that they're designed to work in oil. Now that being said, they're like anything else, they need maintenance, they need to be checked once in a while. Uh, I'll never forget a customer I walked into at one point in time said he was disgusted with sun and gauges. And I asked him why. He says, well, don't measure right anymore. And then I later found out after our discussion that he'd been using the same gauge for 30 years and never had it serviced. Well, gee, everything wears out, guys. I think we all know that. And if things didn't wear out, we wouldn't be in business. So just a word to the wise there. We do, in fact, have replacement parts for gauges, and those gauges uh, we do rebuild as well. Every gauge that I'm going to show you on these next few slides. One of the things that's very important, I'm going to stop here right on this AG gauge, is whenever you go to measure a different size on an AG gauge, meaning that you're putting pins in the gauge, you always want to re-centralize it. Uh, I can't stress that enough. Remember, we're trying to measure down to a tenth of a thousandth of an inch. And if you put in a, a, a pins in it and you get a little spot of dirt underneath one of those pins, it's going to measure wrong, so the center of the hole is not going to be correct. So it's very, very important. Can't stress that enough that we must re-centralize that gauge. Uh, gauge solutions for, for valve guides. Uh, we've made these for a number of years. Uh, one of the things that you, I want to just talk about real quick on this is the P310 gauge. Uh, we only cover a certain uh, 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 range. Uh, if you notice, we don't go down to 5 millimeters. And the reason for that is to make that probe for 5 millimeters, and believe me, we've tried to do it, it becomes so delicate that the problem is that we can, the customer will break them very easily. So we do not make a 5 millimeter. This is the lowest we go on this chart. What we do make for that gauge, for that solution, is a gauge that looks like this. It's simply a split gauge, and the split gauge has ranges anywhere from 54 thousandths up to just over a half an inch. That split gauge can, we can use for measuring valve guides that are 5 millimeter and 4.5 millimeter, for those of you that run into that. Uh, again, talking briefly about our gauge solutions, uh, you know, we, we make uh, gauges to be able to measure lifter bores, and we make them in several different lengths. We make setting fixtures that allow you to set them, and that gauge that I showed you on the previous page is also able to be set by a setting fixture, the CF502. The other gauges, gauges which uh, a lot of you may be familiar with, with checking cylinder bores as well as checking line bores, those gauges are not only available in a, just a standard type gauge, we make them so you can measure down to a tenth of an inch uh, 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 yeah, down to a tenth of an inch, as well as retractable gauges. The retractable gauges, what's nice about them is you can set the pressure as to how much pressure comes out against that cylinder wall by simply rotating the top of the gauge. Now those of you that think that internal combustion engines are like the space shuttle and we got to be able to hone within 50 millions, we make those gauges. We have for a number of years. Those gauges are available to, to you, uh, not only to purchase, but also to lease. So if you're building some high-tech race motor that you think 50 millions makes a difference on an internal combustion engine, we're here to help you. Uh, 
those gauges, again, we can go all the way up to our larger bores. These are basically gauges for measuring parts that are small, not for measuring uh, engine blocks and things of that nature. Okay. Uh, before I go, I want to I want to thank a few people uh, that, especially back at our factory, Sun and Products works as a team. And uh, Jerry Snitzler, I would like to recognize him. He's the guy that actually helped me put together this entire PowerPoint presentation, along with the uh, fine tuning of Gene Miller, and uh, and also the the guy that does all our coordinating out there, Mr. Bob Davis. I uh, I applaud you you people out there. I've worked for Sun for over 16 years now, and I'm going to tell you, everybody at Sun Products is here to help you and to help the customer, or to help help you as the customer. Uh, I will take some questions now if we've got enough time. I put up there my email address, so if your questions don't get answered or you think of them later, please feel free to email me. I'll be happy to get back to you. With that, I'll say thank you, and it's been fun. I hope somebody's learned, everybody's learned a little bit about honing. Uh, thank you, Bob. This is Joe. Uh, we do have some questions that uh, the attendees have asked. Uh, the first one... Okay. Uh, comes from uh, Timothy Meyer, and he uh, wants to know if you have any suggestions uh, for blocks that have added the three center steel caps with the cast iron outer caps. That's a tough one to hunt. <laughs> the, uh, the, the biggest thing that I would, uh, I would say there in that case is if you are having a problem without a roundness, is that you want to make sure that you are that you go ahead and set that mandrel up with the dial indicator as opposed to using pins. Uh, you know, you've really got uh, so, uh, that's a unique situation. Uh, but if we found that you are able to hone those. It's not like uh, in today's world. Uh, also, there's aluminum blocks out there with iron powder caps, which even are much harder. And uh, in those situations, uh, they're a lot more difficult to do. But uh, again, I would make sure that that mandrel is set up with a dial indicator as, close, as opposed to just the pins. And if you start to see that 10 to 2 go out of whack, you want to make sure that you go ahead and advance the stones a little bit further. And uh, one thing that I did forget to mention during this, this webinar is rotating the part. Rotating the part is very important. I hope that answers your question. Well, that may lead right into the next question, uh, Bob, from Paul Nelson with uh, Northwest Technical College. Paul asks, why do so many people rotate the block if the stones and the aluminum shoes are tight in the mandrel? Is this necessary? Uh, absolutely, it's necessary. Uh, again, with the, with the seven degree negative offset, that's pushing that mandrel into the outer round part of the block. Uh, and when you, with caps, when you have, you've got a pretty large out around situation there, and the bottom of the block has not been cut. Remember that, okay? So therefore, what happens is 10 and 2 is what really gets out of whack more than anything else. Although you may be chasing a little bit of taper, uh, you also, the 10 and 2 is what you want to look at. And you will find 90% of the time that 10 and 2 uh, get off by as much as a couple thousands, and that is the reason why we want to rotate that block to allow that stone to get into that tight spot again first. And uh, it, again, it's important to at least rotate the block once when doing that hunting process. Good question. Very good. Uh, another question from Paul. When reconditioning rods, why are they always big at the parting line? I have seen some shops shim the grinder to grind each half at an angle and put stress into the rod in critical areas. Uh, now, I, I will say this, uh, you know, that, that is a practice, and, and particularly some of the production engine rebuilders have, have, have done that, where they actually stress the rod that way. Uh, there's, you know, the main thing that we're concerned about here is the crush of the bearing. Uh, the crush of the bearing must be right. And even though you see a little bit of what we call shading in the parting line, that's actually very normal because that part of the parting line, obviously, we're not doing anything there. If it were my engine, if I were doing it, I would not be concerned with it. But again, if you hand a set of, of connecting rods to a customer and he sees that shaded area, he's going to question whether or not you did a good job. Uh, when I was in the shop, I always hit it. 
It's easy to hide. All you do is take a brush and go through it, and you'll hide it. Uh, <laughs> I know that it may sound like a little so-so uh, deal, but they real, really will work with a little bit of shading. That's just good question. Okay, our next, next question is from Greg West. Any hints for line honing a 400 Chevy block so the rear main seal housing area does not end up being oversized, larger than the 2.841 inches? Uh, that's, that's difficult because every time that manual goes in and, and hones, it, because of the fact that that is so thin, okay, you it's going to take just a wee bit more material. Uh, the only thing that I would say in that respect is what a lot of guys will do because it's a, a when we look at the whole rear main cap in general, okay, it's much wider and obviously it's the thrust. So uh, what a lot of guys do is they will actually cut that cap just a little bit smaller than the rest of the caps. And always remember too on that cap, because your oil pump is mounted to it, that you want to take uh, either an oil pump or part of an oil pump and torque it to it so that it's basically, that will change that size about five tenths in some cases. So uh, I'm sorry I don't have a little better answer than that, but that's that's the best I can, I can tell you at this point. Okay, another question from Paul Nelson. In cylinder honing, I am getting too high of an RVK number and I'm using the EHU-133 stone to do the first step of honing. My RPK is okay. How do I lower my RVK and my RK values? Okay, uh, if you're using an EHU-133 stone, an EHU-133 is a very, is actually a hard stone. It's a roughing stone. Um, I, if, you're, if you're dealing with blocks that were built prior to 1969, those are soft castings that were field cured. Uh, in today's world, those, those castings are they're made differently. Uh, they're a much harder block. I would highly recommend that you use an EHU-123 as opposed to an EHU-133. Uh, this will give you a deeper RBK number. The other, the other thing that you need to take a look at is your next step process. How much more material are you taking with the next step? If you're taking too much, obviously that will destroy your RK and it will also lower your RVK. So uh, I, would, I would recommend that looking at what the next stone is and what your final process is if you're using three steps or if you're using two steps. Okay, another one from uh, Josh, Joshua Alexander. He's asking, how do I get a new Sun and Honings product catalog? Well, there's a, there's a couple of easy ways to do it. Number one, you can just call the 800 number and tell them who you are, and they'll send you one out. Uh, the other way is to get on our website, request a catalog, and as soon as you request a catalog and you give us all your information, we'll send one out. Uh, we're happy to pass them out. Okay, next one is from Jim Washington. And he asks, uh, are the oils MAN 845 and MB30 compatible in any way? Uh, yeah, you can mix the two. It's not going to hurt them. Uh, the only difference between the two of them really is the MB30 oil is a, a higher viscosity oil. Uh, it's got a lot more lubricity in it, and it's the MB30 is is really is more designed for hard steel parts. That's the reason why we we make that oil. But we found that in in some cases, in some of the engine parts, like I talked about, that the MB30 will work just fine. Okay, from Enrique Salinas. If you have to hone a cylinder of 4.950, what do you recommend? A 4.5 or the uh, to the 5 inch or 5 inch to 5.50 mandrels? Okay, let, let me explain how exactly our mandrels are figured. Okay, the mandrels are figured that on the high end of that mandrel, is with the stone worn out, it will do that size. At the low end of that manual, that's figured with a brand spanking new stone. So therefore, to answer your question directly, if you have a manual that has got a worn out stone or a stone that's got some wear on it, 
you could actually use the lesser of the mandibles. Uh, if you have a brand new stone in it, it will not fit a smaller part. But that is a very good question. So in other words, on the 4.950, you do not want to try, try to use the 5.0 with a new stone? No. Okay. Uh, from Ron Sledge, uh, what surface finish do you recommend for the main line and connecting rod big ends? Well, we're using basically 150 grit stone there, and the surface finish numbers, and you're asking me to remember something here, that I want to say the RA number on, on the 150 grit, you're right around the 32 to 40 RA, which is just fine. You don't need to get any finer than that. Uh, let's see. I missed the spot here. Okay. Uh, from Rich Oliver. If I have one cap at size, is it a bad practice to loosen the single cap to minimize removal until the other main, uh, main caps uh, or main bores start to come in? Uh, no, that's a no-no. Uh, if you have one cap to size and the rest of them haven't come in, then what you need to do is take that one cap off and recut it. Because all you're going to do is you're going to destroy your mandrel that's trued in. So you want to keep that, that, that mandrel true. It's not going to hurt it to cut a little bit more off of that cap to bring it back down to the size of the rest of them. Okay, from Wayne Sless, he says, ask, uh, is there any stones available for powder metal con rods? Uh, we can, uh, powder metal con rods will, will, we can use the CR stones, okay? Uh, we have, we have three stones basically that are available, uh, CR10 and a CR10N, which is actually a hardened CR10, a CR, CR12 and a CR14. The CR12 uh, seems to be working pretty good with powdered metal rods. Uh, you know, if you if it, you see the stone causing you trouble, one of the things that you can do to help soften the stone up is to basically take a worn out hacksaw blade, or not totally worn out, but a hacksaw blade, and cut a couple of grooves in that stone. That will act. That will make the stone act softer, and will act to make it act more aggressive on that. Iron okay, we have a few more. Is that you have time, Bob? I certainly do. Go right ahead. Okay, from Stephen Clare, what do you recommend to leave for honing blind cylinders and outboards? Okay, blind cylinders and outboard engines uh, can be a little bit tough. Uh, you know, first off, you're dealing with uh, uh, a uh, you know, you got open ports around that cylinder, so you need to use what we call keyway stones on the, on your hunting head. The other thing that you need to do is if you are having trouble with the stone breaking down on the bottom of the bore, which normally happens with a with a blind hole, we make a stone dependent on again what grit size that you want, uh, and you add A01 on it. And that what that does is we put a little bit harder stone at the bottom of or at the tip of that stone. And it doesn't break down as fast and it doesn't cause the taper that you would see with a normal stone. So that's what I would recommend. Okay, from Enrique Salinas. Uh, do you know why part number RY2600G has been discontinued? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. You had to stump the presenter, didn't you? That's all I got to say. If, if he'll send me an email, I'll be happy to find out why. Okay, Enrique, the ball's back in your court. Okay, from uh, Hoover Oliver. Does Sonnen have general recommendations for the RK surface finish parameters for cylinder bores for applications ranging from light-duty gasoline to heavy-duty diesel? Okay, that's an excellent question, and let me let me answer that question like this. Okay, so many times customers come to us and ask us those that exact 
question. And really, the answer needs to come from the ring manufacturer, not from Sun and Products. We need to know from the ring manufacturer, okay, what they want to see. They're going to want to know what the application is. The application is extremely important when it comes to passing out those kind of numbers. Okay, once we get that information, now we can create with the different combinations of our stones and our tools what you need. Uh, just to throw some numbers out there or wild would be ridiculous. I mean, we have we have tested some things. We know what in fact maybe will work in certain applications. But one thing that I've learned in 32 years of this business, everybody is their own chef when it comes to creating an internal combustion engine and what makes power and what doesn't make power. So from that standpoint, go back to the ring manufacturer, find out what they want, give them your application, come back to us, we'll create it for you. Okay, that's all the questions, Bob. But do you guys have any uh, additional comments before I close out with some other comments? Uh, the only thing I'll say is I really do appreciate everybody's attendance today. This has been fun. I enjoy doing it. Uh, I enjoy working for Sun and Products and all the people back back at the home office that helped me so much during the the work day. And uh, again, I want to I really appreciate PERA being able to put on these type of presentations. I think it helps everybody. Thanks.